Well, hello, this is Dr. Alfgeir Christiansen. I am with uh, Planet Youth and ISRA. I'm located in West Virginia in the States. Pleasant to be here with you and um, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us in this um, online and kind of unusual conference at this time. Today, I'm gonna to be talking about evaluation of the model and uh, uh, the evaluation particularly in Iceland with, with some references to other, other places. Before I move into uh, different studies and different numbers and, and, and assessments that we have done, I'd like to talk about a little bit of uh, the background and prerequisites that we should keep in mind before we um, consider different studies. The first thing we, we need to consider for the evaluation is what really is it that we are evaluating? Because the Icelandic prevention model is not a program in the traditional sense, it's a process structure. And it's a process structure to collaborative partnerships. So before we move into different aspects of uh, process impact and outcome evaluation, let's consider and just remind ourselves what the 10 steps to implementation look like. The first one is local coalition identification, development, and capacity building. And this really concerns whether the local team that we are working with at any given time is capable and suitable to do the work moving forward, both professionally and with regards to time and commitment. Unfortunately, we often have ways to create coalitions or groups of people that work with us and sometimes they are built on uh, people that already are full-time um, in their full-time capacity doing other work. So unfortunately, they may not have much time to give for primary prevention. So in this instance, it's very important for us to identify the right type of mix of people at the local level. The second step is the same, but more specifically about securing the adequate funding for primary prevention activity and particularly to have a local level individual or a set of individuals that are funded to lead the way. Uh, we've experienced time and time again that we may not have the, um, uh, the right mix or the right composition of people to work with us at the local level. And as a result, not much may happen after um, the uh, Planet Youth has created the structure, done the training and data collection and so on. So it's very important to understand that the Icelandic prevention model is based on a collaborative system. And that means that we share responsibilities for improvement and um, the work at the local level. In step three, we, create, we make pre-existing and pre-data collection planning at the community level. We get to know, we notify the community what's planned and what's happening and what our hopes are for this project and for this work moving forward. And in this way, we probably may need to run both meetings and, um, and introductory presentations to our collaborators at the local level. In step four, we collect the data after having planned that carefully in step three, we collect data in schools uh, with our uh, participants then we process that data, uh, clean the data, get it prepared and ready for analysis. And then we run our first analysis and create the first data-driven diagnostics. In step five, we again prepare the community for the dissemination. We prepare them with uh, point of contact in various ways, social media, flyers, um, all calls, uh, and, and so on. And, and this is really to let people know that now the data has been collected, it's ready, and we are coming to demonstrate what the findings show to our community. And we really need the close collaboration of the community. In step six, we disseminate our dissemination plan that we created in step five and moving into step six. And this is basically about where do we distribute the data or the findings of the reports, in what format, and what kind of community meetings are we planning to run in our community? This is really and truly a part of the public health education component of the model. In step six, we get our core stakeholders together and we set goals based on what the findings show in each 
community or local community that we work with. And those may vary. They may vary between communities. They may not be the same for all of them. And as a result, it's very important for us to have regular and uh, consistent rigorous data at the local level. In step eight, we align what our plans are for goals and strategies with existing policy and practice. Oftentimes there are ways to do that locally that may be very helpful for us, such as through school improvement plans, community improvement plans, and so on. And in step nine, we implement the strategies that we have decided in step seven and eight moving forward with the interventions that we chose to work with. Typically, each community picks two, three, or four major issues to work on over the next cycle until we collect the next level of data or next round of data. And in this way, we get some evaluation feedback concerning how we did in the um, uh, past cycle. And step 10 is just a reminder that this is a repetitive process that we should work with for at least five years at a time. Primary prevention takes time and it needs time for us if we are trying to change societies. Because as you know, in the Icelandic prevention model, we are not trying to change individuals. We're trying to change communities and societies. Now, as a reminder, the Icelandic prevention model can be depicted through this figure. This figure really demonstrates our viewpoint of our main constituents who are the kids and the youth that we are working for, working with. Our viewpoint is that kids are by and large products of the social environment, and they are products of four major domains that are largely confined within the local school community. And those are parents and family, the peer group, the school environment, and the leisure time or the free time. And basically the risk and protective factors that we assess in the model and have been working with uh, over a very extended period of time, over 20 years, they are all defined within those four major domains and the local community. Most of them have been studied rigorously in multiple countries, certainly many of them in the United States or in Western Europe or in other Western countries, but they are very universal. And, 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 and actually in our assessment of the relationship between risk and protective factors and the typical substance use outcomes that we work with, those relationships remain the same in any data set that we have looked at and we have analyzed or collected with our collaborators from different European countries, from Central America, from Latin America, from Australia, and even from Africa. So, you know, there, there's really no need to be concerned that these risk and protective factors aren't the same in terms of what the relationship are with the outcomes. We may need to intervene on them in different ways. And that is for the local community really to choose and decide moving forward. And um, <clears throat> importantly, as you see the three circles around those four major domains, the local community, the municipality and the national, this is really how the structure is organized in Iceland. It may be different in other places, but basically, in our situation, the municipalities fund the schools and run their curriculum. So they are really in charge of making sure the schools have the resources at, that they need. So they are our primary funder and primary collaborators at the administrative level. But the data is collected locally at the school level, <clears throat> excuse me, because schools are organized by geographical districts. And as a result, we need to consult with the schools and make sure we understand that kids are typically confined within the local school area in their lives. And as a result, our analysis and reporting takes place largely at the school level. Obviously, there are some mutual similarities between the national and what happens at the national level. So we do collect and distribute data at the national level also. Now, when we evaluate the model, <clears throat> we're really looking at three major components, process evaluation, impact evaluation, and outcome evaluation. This is the traditional division in evaluation components. Process evaluation in this instance is really the question, has the 10-step process been followed appropriately? Can we be sure that whoever is working with us is really following the 10 steps? 
Uh, impact evaluation is really about the independent variables, about this figure, about the risk and protective factors confined within those four major areas, par parents and family, the peer group, the school environment, and leisure time. And as a result, we're really in the impact evaluation, we're asking, <clears throat> excuse me, have the uh, uh, independent variables or the risk and protective factors that we have decided to focus on, have we been, been successful or seen positive change with those. And with outcome evaluation, we are really asking, do we see the desired change in the substance use, the alcohol, tobacco, or other drug use variables that we are working with? Now, the critical difference between the Icelandic standard prevention model and many other prevention approaches, as I mentioned earlier, is the Icelandic standard prevention model is not a program. So a traditional program evaluation where you have a manual that everybody follows and then you have a comparison group and an intervention group really is hard to apply in this instance. So we need to be really clear about what it is that we are assessing. The Icelandic prevention model is a process structure to form and maintain collaborative partnerships and then move on with the work at the local level and structured by the 10 step process. Collaboration is really the central feature of the model. We believe that we can offer some things, which are, for example, the structure, the data collection mechanism, the definition and operationalization of risk and protective factors, and the outcome reports. We then guide our collaborators through the dissemination plan and how they work with that at the local level. And we assist them or consult with them with regards to choosing risk and protective factors to focus on. But what interventions they ultimately end up choosing and what they end up doing at the local level is really the, the decision of the local folks at the local level and given obviously the administrative capacity and funding and so on that they have. And importantly, I'd like to say in this instance that, that you probably know already, that not all interventions need to be very expensive. There are a lot of things that we can do at the local level that really don't cost much. They may cost a little bit of effort and a little bit of time, but they really don't have to be very costly. <clears throat> For example, improving parental monitoring and parental co-communication at the local community level can be done with educating parents at the local level and with um, um, straight up communication systems. That doesn't have to be very costly as an example. Now let's look at process evaluation and I'm gonna, I'm gonna be focused largely on Iceland, but I'll mention a few other instances and places as we go throughout the presentation. Now, as, 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 a, as a sort of an example of how data collection, dissemination and translation now works in Iceland and has for the last 15 to 20 years, the Iceland Prevention Model now reaches communities that include over 90% of children, youth, and families in the country that really work with this data at, uh, actively. There are literally hundreds of data translation meetings, both with individuals and communities and schools and leisure time workers and other professionals every single year, including with elected officials and, and politicians, basically. So, you know, we make sure the data gets out there, people understand what's happening. And after all this time, this has become very much the norm of doing things. Monitoring, goal setting and action is now woven into the fabric of society. This is basically the way we do things. Um, with regards to infrastructure, goal setting and monitoring, it's, it's important for us to underline the importance of long-term funding. Unfortunately, we have a tendency generally in prevention to look at prevention as sort of a, a programmatic artifact. We do this in short-term batches here and there. And there are multiple programs out there that assume that you work with a given group for maybe two months or six months, and then you're just going to see change and move on. The problem is that if you look at what's happening and what typically happens with substance use, among youth and communities is that there are the same areas that disproportionately produce most of the users. Most of the kids that are smoking early, drinking and using other drugs early, they usually come from the same areas. So this idea that we can simply teach them to shy away from drugs or run some kind of short-term program really doesn't add up very well. 
So what we are focusing on here, what we are pointing out is that you really need to change the society or the change the community norms and change the systems and the infrastructure that the kids are part of. In this instance, that takes time. And unfortunately, in the environment that many of us live, for example, myself here in the States, we are usually confined to really working with short-term grant funding when we are running prevention programs. I have not met a, a practitioner yet that isn't dead tired of this endless cycle of grants, programs, grants, programs, grants, programs, it's sort of like a hamster wheel. You write grants all the time. You get, maybe get one out of three in the door. You run programs and then you try to continue to run to fund your basic operations with the same in the same way with, with short term grants and you run programs. Unfortunately, this is not very sustainable. This is not a way to change communities or societies. And as a result, we spend and waste a lot of time and resources on issues that really are marginally relevant to our long-term cause, which is to change the community. Primary prevention specialists are now working across all communities in Iceland. This is one of the bigger infrastructure changes that we enacted in the end of the 90s, early 2000s. And that was really to create a system of people, of professionals, that have their sole responsibility or main responsibility to focus and work on primary prevention. So unfortunately, as I've stated numerous times, we have this tendency to think that primary prevention is something that doesn't require funding or long-term ideas or long-term plans. That means that oftentimes we create task forces or some kind of of, 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 of prevention groups that are supposed to do that in their free time with their left hand. Now in Iceland, what they have acknowledged is that this doesn't work for the long run. We need paid professionals to work for primary, work in primary prevention. And that is what we have done throughout the country and very successfully. Now there are no ifs and buts. There are no questions about who is responsible for prevention at the local level. There is no ifs and buts, who is the main collaborator and really the connector to the ISRA numbers that we provide them on every year and then moving into the community. There is a given individual in each local community that we work with. In addition, uh, with regards to infrastructure, Iceland have seen a massive overall investment in primary prevention, including early detection of alcohol, tobacco and other drug use and intervention um, uh, tools monitor parental collaboration, school support system, and leisure time programs. And this means that we are simply diverting our attention from uh, the need at the, at, the, at the downstream prevention, and we're really thinking about upstream prevention. And I will show you some, some, find, some interesting findings later on that really show how this has changed in the country over time. And finally, in terms of policy and practice alignment, we know that there are multiple policies that have changed in Iceland as a result of the Icelandic prevention model and our work in local communities. For example, there's a now a total visibility ban on tobacco in stores or shops. Uh, they have to be hidden behind curtains or in shelves. There are now governmental guidelines on outside hours that parents and most local communities follow rigorously. This is often referred to as the curfew, and that, which is sort of not the right term for this. But it's basically these are friendly guidelines, but they are, they are worked and, and used um, a lot by um, numerous people, both professionals and families. And now there is a zero tolerance policy on alcohol and other drug use in and around any school gatherings. And in fact, today... If somebody would raise the idea that a kid at the age of 14 or 15 would be drinking prior to a school gathering, most people would find that idea completely ridiculous. But I tell you, 20 years ago, that wasn't the case. Around the millennium, kids typically would meet and party and drink prior to school dances or school gatherings, and that was very much the norm at the time. So that type of norm change is exactly what we are moving towards. So with regards to impact evaluation, again, we're thinking about the risk and protective factors that we work with. Let me just show you a few examples. We published a, a quasi-experimental study in 2010 where we were able to divide into two different groups, communities that have been working with this approach consecutively from 97 to 2009, and communities that had been working, that had not been working with the approach, that sort of decided not to. Now, of course, in Iceland, spillover effects are very likely to be the case when you impact or, or, 
or, or you insert some kind of intervention work in one, two or three communities, chances are that the impacts are going to spill over to other communities. But despite that, we were able to, to, to use pool data from 97, 2000, 2003, 6 and 9, pull that together, divide them into these groups and nearly assess the differences in trend lines over time between those major um, uh, two major groups. And basically what we found is that numerous risk and protective factors and outcomes actually changed more in the intervention communities as compared to the control communities. In this instance, we're working with averages for parental know whom I'm with in the evenings, which is an important measure for parental monitoring. And the interaction term for time times intervention basically is significant showing that there's a greater improvement in the intervention communities compared to the control communities for this measure. The same goes for another type of measure for parental um, uh, monitoring. My parents know where I am in the evenings. This is significant at the 94% level for the intervention community. Sport participation tends to be very protective in Iceland and an important part of our prevention systems. We know that sports are not always protective when it comes to uh, substance use prevention in any setting. There are, it really is about the nature and built up and systems around participation. In Iceland, sports are run through area-based clubs and those clubs, they employ professional trainers and professional staffs that are largely funded by the municipalities. And what this means is that they are really um, um, amenable to instructions and policies based on the municipal sort of holistic model. So kids that participate in sports also do that for the public health impact, not just for competition. And in fact, our rates of kids that, that ever try or initiate at least any kind of sport participation is very, very high. But of course, not everybody can do sports. So there are other things also available and actually plenty of them, both art and, and scout clubs and, and, horse, and horseback riding or, 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 or dealing with horses and, and, and various other things. And, and, and we'll talk about that a little more uh, uh, later on. Now, unsupervised party lifestyle was something that we were really concerned with uh, in Iceland uh, around the beginning of this work. We had this tendency to basically look at Iceland as a very safe community and we didn't really monitor our kids much. And as a result, uh, unsupervised parties were quite common. Uh, this was cracked on and, and really worked on at the, uh, around the millennium and moving forward. And we now see that that, that has really uh, been successful. And again, the intervention groups show greater change over time compared to the control group in this instance. And we can also look at this in a different way by simply doing uh, visual um, trends for um, uh, prevalence uh, with several of these variables based on the ISRA studies, the, 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 the young uh, people in Iceland uh, uh, or youth in Iceland studies. And this is, this is important here. You, you look at this as an example. These are rates for students in ninth and 10th grade who spend time often or almost always or report that they spend time often or almost always with their parents during weekdays. One of the problems that we had in Iceland was that we felt uh, like or people tend to feel that work was more important than um, spending time with our kids. So this was one of the things we know from the literature is important, and this has been changed drastically over time. Now, if you look at what happened in, in, in 97, 23% of kids say that this applies often or almost always to them. And then it sort of rises to 33% 2006, nine years later, 46% six years later, and then onwards to 50% in 2014 and basically has remained around 50 to 52, 3% since. So over the last six, seven years, we haven't really seen any change. We have been able to sustain the changes that occurred in the beginning. And this is very important because what this shows is that the environment that kids enter now at this age, because as you know, there are always new kids in these data pools every year. That means that the environment that 13, 14, 15, 16 year old kids are entering uh, around our time, as opposed to 20 plus years ago, is totally different. Now, the parental norms have completely been um, changed. 
This is a similar measure. My parents know where I am in the evening, sort of a parental monitoring item. This was 52% for applies very or rather well to me in 2000, rose to 75, 80% 2014, 16, and is now 81%. So basically, we see, uh, again, this consistency over the last seven, eight years that we have been able to sustain. Students in 10th grade that participate in sports with a club or team four times or more often. Again, sports have been one of those factors that we have emphasized very strongly in our leisure time programs. And you see that there's this dramatic rise between 2000 and 2012 from 23 to 42%. And basically it's remained around that ever since. So again, we've been able to maintain for eight or nine years a very similar high level rates of participation in uh, this uh, protective factor. And rates of uh, late outside hours, again, as with party lifestyle and, and these issues that I mentioned earlier, we know that um, supervision is very important. It doesn't mean we have to be breathing down the kid's neck all the time. Basically, it means that they are supervised and we know what they're doing so for the most part. And we see that unsupervised late outside hours, this is for three times or more often in the past week after 10 o'clock, has dropped significantly from 2000 when it was 53% to 23% in for 2014. And basically it's remained around 22, 23% ever since. We've also done various trend analysis. This one is from 2016, published in Addiction and uh, really both showcasing impact and, excuse me, outcome evaluate or outcome variables. Let me just look at some uh, outcome, excuse me, impact variables here. To the far left, you see the tests at the variables that we are looking at. Parents know where I am. Parents know with whom I am. Parents know my friends. My parents know my friends' parents, uh, which is sort of a measure of social capital. Organization, organized sport participation and party lifestyle, similar to the factors that we assessed before. And then on the far right are the F tests for linear trends. And we see that those are all significant over time. The test in this instance, instead of looking at different in percentages or, 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 or prevalence, we are really looking at average or, or mean scores based on scaled measures. Now, outcome evaluation, you probably all see this figure numerous times, but this figure represents a more drastic change than we see really anywhere. 42% of our kids in 10th grade were drunk in the past month in 1998, and that ratio is about 6% now. This is a really, really drastic change over a 22, three-year period. Now, importantly, I want to highlight uh, what I said earlier. If you look at the sort of break around 2011-12, you see we reached a, a, a bottom there. And then since, we've been able to basically maintain that trend. So now it, it sort of looks like we can't get much lower with this population. And importantly, again, we need to probably remind ourselves that there are new kids that come into these cohorts every year. The 10th graders in 2015, they are 20 years old in 2019. The 10th graders that are come into that in 2010, they are 20 year old um, they are 20 year old uh, in 2015 and so on. So, so really it's a new group of kids every time. And that's important because we see that you can sustain these type of changes without really chasing the individuals because we have changed the community norms and changing norms takes time. Changing the way we actually do things, how we act around our kids is something that takes time. But now for the last eight, nine years, we really have seen a consistent very, very low uh, numbers. Again, the same paper with regards to the outcomes, the quasi-experimental paper. In this instance, we're testing the differences in daily smoking during the last 30 days. This has been uh, similar to the previous ones. We see greater change in the, inter in the uh, intervention group than comparison group. This is, this is significant at the 90% level. And then intoxication for the last 30 days or drunkenness for the last 30 days. Again, this is similar, significant actually at the 99% level. And in this instance, the interaction term uh, is significant for the intervention group. Same uh, study as before that appeared in addiction. This time we're testing outcome variables. So the far left there, any smoking in the last 30 days, daily smoking, any alcohol use or drunkenness. And on the far right is the linear trend test. Um, and again, that's uh, significant over a period of time. So 
you know, again, we see this drop, this massive drop in the major drivers, smoking, tobacco use, alcohol use. And uh, um, um, as a result, we are obviously seeing lots of other changes also. And cannabis or, or other drugs are, are typically very low in this age group in Iceland. Now, another way of looking at um, uh, the progress in Iceland is to really look at comparative studies. And the ASPAT report, uh, you probably all know the European school project, school survey project on alcohol and other drugs. This is a comparative study conducted in uh, 30 plus 35 plus countries in Europe every three to four years. The last one was from 2019 and is, is come out recently. They typically take about two years to get the report out, but this is a very comprehensive material and, and very well conducted, very helpful for us to sort of place where we stand compared to Europe. Um, now, in the end of the 90s, Iceland was comparatively high or ranked comparatively high in substance use compared to most countries in Europe, including particularly for tobacco and alcohol use. Um, and now we have been at the bottom or close to the bottom for several years. So let me just highlight a, a couple of important uh, findings here. The table to the right there is, is about early onset of substance use. And this shows the percentages of students using substances at the age of 13 or younger. And this is very important because we know in primary prevention and have known for a long time that kids that initiate use at this age or younger that initiate use very early, they are much more likely to escalate into serious problems with their use. With their use. Um, so it's very important for us to delay the onset of use as long as possible. In this instance, you see the arrows there that point towards cigarette smoking and um, uh, alcohol use or, or, or use for the first time before or at the age of 13. The range in Europe is from 5.4% to 33 for cigarette smoking and from 7.1% to 60% for alcohol. And actually, Iceland represents the lowest number in both of those instances. 5.4% belongs to Iceland for cigarettes and 7.1% to uh, for alcohol belongs to Iceland. Now, we have been dealing with other issues, of course, as most countries. For example, we had a surge in e-cigarette use over the last seven years or so. Um, but we are now starting to see a positive turnaround on that as well. There are also numerous trend lines that you can look at in the ASPAT report. In this instance, you see Iceland here sort of close to the center. And uh, we see this downward trend for this is daily use of cigarettes by 10th grade students. And uh, the yellow uh, line represents a non-significant change. Green represents a downward significant change. And red represents a upward significant change. And you see that Iceland is now getting so close to the bottom for daily cigarette use that it, it, it really doesn't measure any change anymore. Many other countries or several other countries at least have experienced downward trends or change in this respect. But Iceland still is, is, is quite exceptional in this case. The same goes for heavy episodic drinking. This is Iceland compared to numerous other countries in the report. Um, and again, we are getting very, very close to the bottom there with um, uh, this measure for drinking. Um, this is also helpful. This is a table that shows the prevalence of cigarette smoking um, in Iceland for in various measures, lifetime use, 30 day use and so on. And you see that Iceland is there around the middle, 15% lifetime use, 30 day use is 5.1, uh, which is usually referred to as current use in the research literature. But the reason I wanted to point this out is that Iceland is the absolute bottom at the table compared to the rest of Europe in 2019. So we have maintained our position either at the bottom or very close to the bottom in most categories. The average for Europe for lifetime use of cigarettes is 41% for 10th grade students. We're at 15, 20% for 30 day use, we're at 5.1. And in fact, if you look and compare the whole thing, you, you see that we are quite different from most of, of the country, uh, countries that we are compared to. Now for alcohol use, we are now second. Kosovo comes new into the study and is below us. But if you compare those two countries to the rest for the prevalence of alcohol, you see that we both of those countries are truly different from the rest. The average of lifetime use for alcohol in 10th grade is 79% for Europe. It's 37 in Iceland, basically less than half of um, 
uh, uh, the European average, 29 for Kosovo and 11% for 30 day use and 10 for Kosovo, even, even lower for intoxication. And so, you know, we have been able to maintain this position compared to the other European countries. Now, what about other related issues? Let's just talk about a few important things. We did a study that we published actually this year. In this instance, we used a longitudinal design. We chased our participants over a period of time. So we, we were able to identify the individuals and collectively assess them over a 12 months apart. And what we were doing here is to test the risk protective factor assumptions in the model. One of the things that we have always been very vocal about is the fact that we have emphasized is the fact that when kids are at risk, they are usually at risk for multiple things. They're not just at risk for drinking or smoking or school dropout or sexual risk behavior or delinquency or violence. They are usually at risk for lots of different things. They are basically risk prone individuals. And that may stem both from their environment, their immediate environments, their extended environments and as individuals. But what we are focusing on here is really to look at several risk and protective factors at the same time and asking ourselves this question. If we look at how they relate over time to the odds of initiation with smoking, e-cigarettes and alcohol, is it, is it so that there's just a few or maybe one or two factors that matter? So on the left side here, you see that these are the risk and protective factors that we're working with in this study, parental monitoring, time spent with parents, social capital, which is this measure of do your parents know your friend's parents or know your friends, low school engagement, late outside hours, sport participation, and other organized recreational activities. And then we have four outcome variables that are here at the top, ever smoking, ever e-cigarette use, ever alcohol, or ever cannabis use. And these were kids that were uh, 13 and 14 years old at the time. And what we see basically is that in all the models, all these factors are significant except organized recreational activities at a time. And what that basically means, or with one exception here, what that basically means is that it isn't so that it's just about improving parental monitoring or just about improving school engagement or just about sport participation or recreational activities. It's really about all those things at the same time calling attention to the importance of community building. So in this instance, testing the risk and protective factor assumptions in the Icelandic model is really about showing that there are lots of different things that impact our kids at the time. So working with single-headed programs that only focus on one outcome and one risk and protective or protective factor is really inadequate and isn't really the right way to look at community impact when it comes to our kids. Now, this is interesting and, and something else I wanted to highlight to you. Now, as you may remember, the picture that depicts the function of the risk and protective factors, the four domains of parents and family, the peer group, the school environment, and the leisure time that we focus on, it really isn't much about drugs. This approach isn't really about drugs. It's about building stronger communities assessing where we are strong, assessing where we are weak or where we need more uh, or where we are limited and need more resources or, or programs and so on. And then assuming if we build our communities well, we will see several different outcomes. Now, this has been worked with now in Iceland for a consecutive period of time over 20 years. And this is interesting in this respect. What this graph shows is basically the frequency of young men that need drug treatment by SAA. SAA is the largest drug system or drug prevent dr drug excuse me drug treatment uh, facility in the country. The yellow line shows the frequency for men at the age of 20, 20 or younger that come to treatment, and the red line for the uh, men at the age of eighteen or younger. The y-axis shows birth cohorts. So the first number, 1982, are basically men that were born in 1982. They are, were 20 years old in 2002. And those born in 1997 were 20 years old in um, 2007, excuse me, 2016. And because this report is from 2016, 
excuse me, 2017, and the report is from 2016. What this shows then are the 18-year-olds all the way through and the 20-year-olds until 1995. So in short, for the 1982 cohort, about 5.7% of this cohort ever came to drug treatment up till the year 2016. For the 1995 cohort, that number was about 2.7%. So what this basically shows is that because of the extensive changes in primary prevention in Iceland, we have now more than halved the need for drug treatment for men at the age of 20 or younger. And the numbers are very similar for the 18 year olds. Almost 3% ever came to drug treatment of the 1982 cohort, less or about 1% of the 1997 cohort that were 18 in 2015. So in other words, as I'm sure you know, drug treatment is the most expensive, least effective way of battling substance use at the population level. Now I wanna underline, we of course support the need for drug treatment when that is warranted. But as a public health policy, that is not really the best way moving forward. It's much more suitable and work much better to start earlier and move upstream with primary prevention approaches rather than waiting for the individuals that come to treatment or need to come to treatment later on. And as I'm sure you also know, each individual that comes, each individual that comes to drug treatment is very expensive for society. They usually have cost a great deal in healthcare, in family, lost time from work. Obviously, apart from all the worrying and all the breakdown in emotional relationships and so on. So this is really interesting because the Icelandic prevention model isn't, again, so much about drugs. It's about community building, strengthening protective factors, driving down risk factors. But as a result, we have way fewer people come to drug treatment. Other measures that we have seen changing over time because of holistic changes in community or society are, for example, bullying. In 1999, 35% of our kids say that they have been a part of a group teasing an individual once or more often. That number was 7.5% in 2016. And other similar measures have also fallen drastically. In other words, there is just much less bullying than there was. In terms of delinquency and theft, in 1997, 31.6% of our kids say that they stolen something worth less than 5,000 Icelandic kroner once or more. That's about 50 American dollars, about 40 euros. These are 10th grade students. That number is about 14% in 2016. Other measures, again, have decreased substantially as well. So, you know, we see differences in, even in delinquency. What about other places? Um, we have had less um, manner or way of assessing true process impact and outcome with many of our foreign partners because it's relatively recent that we started working systematically with multiple different places. But we have some findings that we can rely on. Riga and Latvia started working with us during the Youth in Europe study in 2008. And um, beyond, we are not really sure what they have done beyond the data collection, dissemination, and public health education piece. But we know that the data that they have collected and disseminated has certainly garnered a lot of attention. And they have acquired and been able to see really drastic changes over time as a result of their work. In 2008, over 30% of their kids stated that they were daily smokers. That's about 11% now. 26% were had been drunk in the last month, about 16% now. And 21% said that they'd used cannabis substances at least once in their lifetime. That's again, about 16% now. We also have been working uh, with a group in uh, Lithuania for yeah quite some time since the Youth in Europe study, and uh, basically in the three largest cities of Kaunas, Klaipeda, and Vilnius. And we did a trend analysis study and published that in uh, this year about the situation in uh, Lithuania. Uh, this is kind of complicated to look at, but basically in the upper half, you have uh, trends for different um, outcome variables to the upper far left there, smoking 30 days, daily smoking, alcohol use, drunkenness in lifetime, drunkenness in the 30, last 30 days, cannabis and amphetamine use. Then you have the cities, Kaunas, Klaipeda, and Vilnius on the far right, and the years of data collection, 2006, 8, 12, 14, 16, 18. 
and an assessment of linear trend. And basically, they have seen a steady downward trend in all those measures over this period of time, with maybe one or two exceptions. Actually, all those measures at, on, this, on substance use. For risk and protective factors, which are the bottom half of the table, we see four measures of parental um, involvement. Parents know whom I'm with in the evenings, where I am in the evenings, know my friends, and know my friends' parents. And those, again, have also been significant in um, the improved direction, as well as for participation and party lifestyle. So, you know, again, Rika, uh, excuse me, uh, Lithuania has been, has, been, has been working with us for an extended period of time, and they've shown great results also. Now, in terms of process evaluation, our partners in the Netherlands, um, uh, the Trimpos Institute that's, that has been leading the way for uh, uh, several municipalities that have been working with us for the last couple of years, they did a preliminary process evaluation uh, on their work and uh, uh, quite promising so far. After one year, they were able to state that the pre preliminary process evaluation shows promise and suggests that the Iceland prevention model is additive to existing methods. They basically say that this access to localized detailed data really has truly impacted the way people work in prevention. Our colleagues in Chile, they wrote a sort of a position paper on the feasibility of planet youth implementation in Chile. This is brand new actually, and, and just was, was published. And basically their conclusion is that the Icelandic prevention model is a flexible method suitable for adaptation in Chile. So, uh, and this is coming from the local group uh, over there. Um, I wrote uh, with my, actually, I was a co-author on a paper that was mostly written by our colleagues in Canada in, in Lanark County, which is a, a small county outside of Ottawa. And they created an implementation plan for the isolating model uh, over there and, and published uh, uh, last year. And uh, very interesting to see how they have decided to move things forward based on uh, the premises of the model. And unfortunately, they had to postpone uh, their data collection due to COVID, but uh, we are looking forward to uh, their work moving forward. And finally, uh, I did, uh, uh, have been working with this approach now in two counties here in West Virginia. We're not really there yet with regards to data, but we have collected two rounds of data and, and certainly preliminary numbers are promising. But we also did a feasibility study in a separate county, in, a, in a, quite a rural county in uh, West Virginia, by interviewing or running focus groups with adults, both from the professional community and general citizens. And our conclusion there is the Icelandic prevention model should be very helpful and feasible to work on prevention in this setting, coupled with other approaches. Now, in terms of next steps, our main concern now with all our Planet Youth partners is to really keep evaluation material coming in. Um, process evaluation, multiple planet youth partners are now following the 10 step process with regular process data collection. In other words, we are collecting data with them every month or, 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 or uh, quarterly, four times a year, where they showcase basically what their goals have been between layers of data collection and what they have decided to work on with our support and project management from our side. With regards to impact evaluation, Planet Youth Part to select the ideal risk and protective factors they want to focus on for the next cycle until we collect data again. And in this instance, again, we um, uh, focus heavily on consulting with them and supporting them. They may pick things from a handful or actually from several different types of interventions that we can offer, but they also are, are obviously welcome to pick their own it all depends on what the local community decides. And, and that is not for us to decide, that's really for the local team to decide on each occasion. And outcome evaluation assessment on the relationship between risk and protective factors selected by the partners and the alcohol, tobacco and other drug use outcomes continues to be of importance. And, and, and we will move on with that process. And we're looking forward to um, uh, doing further evaluation studies into different areas. Um, I'd like to leave you with this comment, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. There are multiple studies, cost-benefit studies and other studies that show that prevention truly pays off. It's a matter of changing our mindset a little bit and getting our elected officials to really see the value of long-term investment in prevention rather than always working downstream. 
And uh, as a result, we, we can have positive outcomes. And with that, I thank you for your attention and look forward to engaging with you in further discussion about the model and hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. See you later.